Jesus' name. And uh, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, uh, I'm glad that he's still God. Amen. Amen. You ain't got to look like we ain't in a funeral home this morning. This is church, all right? This just want to remind you, all right? We, we, we don't worship the God of the dead. We worship the God of the living. He's alive and well. And dead men don't make much sound. But if you're alive, you ought to, you ought to be a sound come from you this morning. I bless his name and I appreciate the good singing. appreciate the opportunity to get to be with you again this morning. And I'm just looking forward to what God... Uh, is going to do. I want you to take your Bibles. We find in the book of Matthew this morning, Matthew chapter number 17. Matthew chapter number 17, the gospel according to Matthew. I give you the thought the Lord has laid upon my heart. I want you to pray real hard for me and uh, that, that I can uh, 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 get myself out of the way, let God uh, have his own way this morning. I was in my study this week. God gave me a, uh, God gave me a thought, and, uh, and you all pray that I'll get it out. Uh, I'm gonna need I'm gonna need some uh, some help of the Holy Spirit this morning, and uh, so I, I I do desire your prayers this morning. Matthew chapter number seventeen, and when you find your place, if you're willing and able, I'm gonna ask you to stand, and we'll honor the reading of the Word of God this morning. Matthew chapter number seventeen. Uh, good to see you here uh, in the house of God today. Matthew chapter number seventeen. Good to hear uh, the brother getting saved this morning. Amen. Aren't you glad for that? And uh, I'm glad he's a God that can still, he's in the saving business, friend. If you're here and you're not saved, uh, uh, you're in a good place. And uh, he's a God that not only wants to save you, but he will save you and he can save you. Uh, the preacher can't save you. Singers can't, can't save you. Uh, but Jesus can. You turn to Jesus. Matthew chapter number 17 and verse number 14. Matthew chapter number 17 and verse number 14. If you love your Bible this morning, would you let it know by saying, Amen. Amen. The Bible says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Let's ask God to help us this morning. Father, I pray now you bless thy word, that I pray you bless the preaching time. Lord, do what only thou can do. Take this unworthy vessel, use it for thy glory and that alone. And we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it all for what you're about to do. In Christ's high and holy name we do humbly pray. Amen and amen. You can go ahead and be seated this morning. Thank you so much for standing. Back to the honor and reverence of the word of Almighty God. Matthew chapter number 17 opens up with one of the greatest uh, confirmations, probably the greatest confirmations of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ within his human life. It is here we see the Lord Jesus and three of his disciples. The Bible says it was Peter, James, and John who are up on top of a, of a high mountain, the Bible says. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration because of what took place here upon that mountainside that day. It was on the mountaintop to which the Lord Jesus would reveal himself in, in such a way that those that stood by that day, they would see him for who he really was. They were to see him in a form that not everybody 
uh, gets to see. For a moment in time, by the way, we don't know how long this moment in time was. We don't know if it was a long period of time. We don't know if it was a short period of time. All we know is that for a period of time, these men got to see the manifestation of the glory of Almighty God on display as the Lord Jesus would be uh, transfigured before their very eyes. I mean, could you imagine standing by that day and seeing what these men got to see? I mean, could you imagine standing there that day and getting to watch as the as the very face of the Son of Almighty God, as it would take to uh, change forms before their eyes, as they would watch as the as the glory of God would begin to appear, and, and as he as uh, it began to shine, as the sun, the Bible says, and uh, the divine glory of God would begin to radiate from the dear Savior's face, and uh, it would illuminate even his garments, as the Bible says that his garments would begin to shine forth as the light. They would turn wide. By the way, this experience on top of the mountain that day, it was only a foretaste of what is yet to come. It was only a foretaste of the day that is ahead of the of which the Bible says that the Son of Man is going to come uh, in the glory of his Father. And all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn for they shall see uh, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and a great glory. I don't know about you this morning, uh, but I'm looking forward to that day. Amen goes right there. I'm talking about the day uh, when you and I are going to get to see him for who he really is. I mean, can you imagine what it's going to be like? A standing in the very presence of Almighty God. And we see him what no man was able to see down here and live. But in the presence of Almighty God, we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. Uh, by the way, Peter says here in the text, he said, as he stood there and witnessed uh, all of this taking place and as he stood there and witnessed the very uh, Son of God take on a different form. Uh, here's what Peter said. He said, it's good for us to be here. Amen. Now, may I say it's always good to be in the presence of God. It's always good to be, uh, old preacher used to say it like this, under the spout where the glory comes out. It's always good to be where the, where the glory of God is, the presence of God is. I think the best thing that can happen to us here this morning is for you and I to see him as who he really is and to bask in his presence for just a little bit. I guarantee you when you left church uh, uh, being in the presence of God, uh, you could say too, just along with Peter here in the text, it sure was good to be in the house of God. Peter, he says, it's good for us to be here. It's good for this. Now, as much as I would love to spend all, all our time this morning on the, on the mountaintop, preach on the presence of God and the glory of God and, and uh, uh, the mountain of transfiguration, I would, I would love to do that. But what I'm most interested in this morning is not necessarily what took place on top of the mountain, but what took place at the foot of the mountain. The Bible says here in the text that as they were coming down from the mountain, as they come off the mountain and as they, they approach the multitude, the Bible says there was a man that began to approach the Lord Jesus. And uh, this man we find in the text, we, he, we see that he approaches the Lord on behalf of his son. The Bible says that he come to Jesus and he's kneeling down. And he says, have mercy on my son. We see that this man had a son who was in a, a very bad way. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that uh, this son was demon-possessed. In other words, he was controlled. He was influenced by uh, the demons of, of hell. And by the way, I want to say this, demon possession is real, friend. You better look up in here and hear what I'm telling you. Uh, that stuff is real. You say, I don't believe in that. Well, I mean, how, you, you, you ain't just, you've been living under a rock somewhere is all I can tell you because you look in the world we're living in. I'm telling you, friend, people can't act 
act the way they act and people can't do the way they do uh, just on their own. I mean, even when you think that people can't get no more wicked and they can't get no more evil and they can't get no more vile and they can't get no more uh, cold-hearted, all of a sudden you turn your news channels on and find out that week after week they get worse and worse and worse. You say, can you explain that? Are they under the influence of something uh, from a different world, that dark world, that evil world? I'm telling you, friend, demon possession is very real in 2021. This man here, he comes to the Lord on behalf of his son. His son uh, is uh, uh, possessed with the devil. This father we find in the text, he's desperate. He's helpless. He's seemingly helpless in the text. We can see it as he comes and has the cry unto the dear Savior. And no doubt as any parent would be, uh, this man, uh, if he could have healed his son, no doubt he would have. Uh, if this man could have fixed his son's problems, uh, no doubt he would have. He would have done that. If he could have cured him, he would have done that. Uh, but the reality was there was nothing uh, that this father could do for his son uh, in the moment of time that could do uh, what was needing done in his life. And so he comes to the Lord Jesus and he begins to intervene uh, with the Savior on behalf of his son. Uh, by the way, as much as you and I as parents today as much as we would love uh, to do for our own kids. I mean, uh, you know you, you know uh, what I'm talking about. When they're sick, you want to help them. Uh, when they're in trouble, you want to help them. Uh, when something's broke, you want to fix it. Uh, you want to do all that you can do. Uh, because as any good parent, you love your kids. You love you. Uh, you want to you wanna be there for them. And, uh, you want to uh, you wanna meet their needs, but you hear me and hear me well. Uh, there are some things that uh, no matter how much you love your kids, uh, no no matter how much you try to do for your kids, uh, there's some things that you just can't do for them. Uh, there's some things that they got to learn and understand that mama can't do for them and daddy can't do for them. Uh, you understand there's some spiritual, uh, there's some spiritual things uh, ahead for every uh, man, woman, boy, and girl uh, that mom and daddy can't do for them. Uh, look up in here. Only Jesus can save their soul. Only Jesus can write their name uh, in the Lamb's book of life. Only Jesus can forgive their sin. I, I wish I had somebody to help me preach this morning. I'm saying uh, only Jesus can do for them. That's why it's important you bring in babies to church. Amen. One old preacher told me one time, he said, hey, uh, don't you worry about them kids make a little noise in the house of God. He said, I'd rather, he said, he said, I'd rather uh, it be a noisy house uh, than, than a quiet house because when you got a noisy house, that means you got a healthy church. Uh, that means you got a care church uh, of tomorrow. Uh, some in places I go, it's quiet as a mouse. I look out there and I say, man, I mean, I like to hear a kid every day. Some places, I mean, you can't get a holy grunt out of nobody. I just seen there be a house full of kids make a little racket. At least I think they were with me when I was a preaching. Amen. amen. Them kids don't bother me. Preach louder. Sing louder. Shout amen a little bit louder. If you ain't louder than babies, then ain't something wrong with you. It ain't their fault. They don't know. They got to learn. Live a life of godliness before them. Teach them. And so here this man is. I've got to hurry. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get somewhere to give you the thought. This man, he comes to the Lord, verse number 16. And the man tells the Lord in verse number 16, uh, he brought his son uh, to the disciples, but the disciples couldn't do anything for him. They couldn't fix him, they couldn't help him, and they could not cure him. Jesus says, bring him to me. And the, and the man obviously brings the boy unto the Savior in verse number 18. And, and the Bible says that Jesus rebukes the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Now here's what I want you to see. After this takes place, by the way, that is the God we serve. I mean, he's a God that can do the impossible. He's the God that what nobody else can do, uh, he can get it done, friend. Uh, what's impossible with me is very possible with God. 
And so, but after this takes place, after 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 the man and the son go away, and after the multitude uh, is, is departed, and after there's this separation, uh, the Bible says that the disciples, uh, they come unto the Lord Jesus after it was all t- uh, taken place, uh, kind of when they're by themselves, if you will. Uh, they used the, the Bible used the term when they, as they came apart, they began to ask the Lord, they had a question in that to the Savior, and notice what they said. They said, why could not we cast him out? In other words, why couldn't we help him? Yeah, he did. He did bring that boy to us. Why? Why y'all was? Why y'all was up there? Why y'all was away? And we tried, but why couldn't we help him? What was the problem? What was we? What was we doing wrong? What was? Uh, what was missing? Where did we go wrong? Where did we mess it up? Why? Couldn't we heal him? No doubt they were confused. No doubt they were troubled. No doubt they couldn't figure it out what the problem was. They didn't know what they was doing wrong. And how did we miss it? Where did we go wrong? What's a, a, what, a, 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 what are we missing? And no doubt there was an element of embarrassment along with these men as well. Uh, you think about it. I mean, these are the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, these are the ones that are walking with him. Uh, these are the ones that are talking with him on a regular basis. Uh, this is the very representation uh, in that of the Lord Jesus Christ and if anybody should have been able uh, to step out and help somebody in need and get them going in the right direction uh, you would have thought it would have been the ones uh, that walked with the Savior and followed after the Savior uh, it would have been the ones uh, that knew the man personally who had opened blinded eyes before and caused deaf ears to hear and fed the 5,000 or oh, just uh, uh, a couple of fish and, uh, and a couple of loaves of bread I mean, it was just, uh, uh, you would have thought it would have been that crowd uh, that could have helped that man and his son. Uh, But the truth of the matter was, uh, when it came down to it, uh, when they were put on the spot, when a man was looking for help and looking for guidance and needing a touch uh, from something uh, bigger and greater than he was, the reality was they could not deliver. They couldn't help him. And so with the help of the Lord, I'm preaching on this thought. And I've got a couple of points. I'll give them to you quick and I'll be done. But I'm preaching on this thought. Why can't we? Why can't we? I think you'll agree with me this morning when I say that the effectiveness of many Christians and many churches today is not on the level of which we would like it to be. I'm just being honest. We, when I say effectiveness, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about, you know, this, I'm talking about the effectiveness, I'm talking about the impact that we are having on those around us and the world in which we are living in for the cause of Christ. We are living in a very powerless generation. You can say amen right there. I know, I, I know it may be. Uh, look up in here. It might not, this, this might not be what you want to hear this morning, but it's something we sure do need to hear uh, because it's the truth and the truth. Uh, hey, look up in here. I don't need a man of God to get up and tell me a lie over and over and over and pat me on the back. I want a man of God to get up and preach the truth to me. Uh, tell me where I'm wrong. Uh, tell me where I'm at. And the reality is we're living in a generation that, uh, that knows very little uh, of the power of God and the power from upon high. And most people, uh, they know very little of that. And uh, many have heard testimony today how that God has moved in days gone by and how that God used to do it and uh, used to move and how he did this and how he did that. Uh, how that used to the power and the presence of God would fill a room and it would get so thick that lives would be changed and conviction would be real and sinners should walk an aisle. I uh, get cry out uh, for having mercy uh, I cry out to the Savior to have mercy on their souls. I mean, a uh, week in and week out, that's what they experience, and that's what they saw. Uh, but nowadays, this generation knows very little of that. And now it's just testimonies. Now it's just something that they've heard about and not in the very little of what they've experienced themselves. Uh, most churches have become a place of gathering today and a place of socialism uh, where people come and they make an appearance uh, because they know 
uh, that they need to go to church and it makes them feel good and uh, you know everything uh, seems to be better but yet yeah, they never experience the raw power and that of a holy God. Uh, the same can be said about our preaching. Uh, amen goes right there. We might as well hit it all this morning. Uh, they said, hey, it seems like nowadays uh, because we've got a little education and uh, now we know how to write an outline and uh, now we know how to preach just a little bit. Uh, it's like we've forgotten uh, what them old timers had. Uh, I mean, hey, they might not have been able to read for you, uh, but they had something that we're missing in this day and this hour. Uh, that is, they had the touch of God. They had the power of God dripping off all of them. Uh, they might not have been able to get up and write an outline and, you know, a quote a bunch of scripture or do this or that. Uh, but you could tell that them unlearned men, they had been along with God. Uh, they got something to do. Uh, you and I are some good to get in this day and in this hour. Something was missing. That's true to be said, said about our singing as well. Oh, I've seen it, friend. I mean, I've seen it. I like good singing. I mean, I like to hear. I like to hear good singing. That's good singing. We got to hear this morning. I like to hear that. But I'm gonna tell you, friend. I've seen it done. I've seen a good singer get up. I mean, they got all kinds of talent and ability and all that, but they just something missing. And then I see somebody get up. And they don't have nearly the talent. And they don't have the lungs that that other had. But they got something. <laughs> They got something, they got something on it. I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about. And there's a difference in that, friend. Amen. The power of God. The presence of God. No doubt we're missing it in this day and in this hour. All the while we're living in a world that's filled with desperation. A world that's in need. A world that's looking for help in the one place where you think that they should be able to find it. At the house of God. Among the people of God. Under the preaching of the word of God, you would think that the one place they should be able to find that help, they could find it. But reality is, very often, it's not found. And so I want to echo the question this morning that the disciples asked. And to the Savior, I want to ask you and me, why is that? Why can't we? What's the problem? Why are we missing it? What is going wrong? I got three points. I'll give them to you real quick. Here they are. Number one. First of all, I want you to see the concern. The concern. Verse number 19. Notice the question. They said, why could not we cast him out? Notice this. They were bothered and they were troubled by the situation that was at hand. It bothered these old boys that they couldn't help his daddy. It bothered them that they, that they, they, they were no uh, more of a help to a man who was in need and a boy who needed uh, some spiritual direction. They, 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 it bothered them that they couldn't help him no more than they did. They were not okay with just saying, well, you know, we tried. It just didn't work out. I mean, we, 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 we tried to reach out. We tried to, uh, you know, do what we know how to do, but it just didn't work out. No, they were bothered by it. They were troubled by it. You know what bothers me today? And listen, I'm not trying to be negative against the church. Look up in here. I'm not trying to be negative against other preachers, other ministries, because any man that'll get up and want to spend his time throwing rocks at the church down the street and throwing rocks at the preacher across town and throwing rocks at this ministry and that ministry and, hey, hey they ain't God. God ain't in that mess. God ain't going to bless that. And that's not, that's not what I'm doing. That's not my intentions this morning. That's not what I'm, that's not what I'm about. But at the same time, I do not believe that living in denial to the current condition and the spirituality of many churches today and many Christians today, I don't believe that does any good either. Amen. Amen. You know what bothers me? is a lack of concern in this day and hour. Even inside the house of God. I mean, there's many places I go, preacher, and, and man, I must be honest with y'all, all right? This is my second week with you, so you know we kind of got to know each other just a little bit, so I'm going to be a little honest with you this morning. <laughs> Don't tell on me now. There's many places I go and preach, and, and I get to preach in some good churches. Don't get me wrong. But I preach in a lot of bad churches, too. I mean, there's places I go and preach, and it's like, Lord, help. 
What are we doing? I mean, it's just dead. It's dry. I mean, it's hard. I'm, I, I'm thinking, no wonder we ain't seeing God move in here. No wonder we ain't seeing nobody say. No wonder we, I mean, I, I mean, it's terrible. But here's what, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about I preach in places. I'm embarrassed for them. I feel bad for them that, that, that it's got that bad, that it's in that condition. And here's what really bothers me. You'll walk out the door, and you can hear them, you know, you people say, well, how'd it go? Hell is, uh, you know. Yeah, it was good. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Let's be honest. I'm waiting for the one to be honest enough to say, that was terrible. <laughs> it was awful. We missed the mark. We dropped the ball. Everybody, you know, we've, we've come to this, you know, pacified society where just talk that it's good and living in it. No, 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 no. No, I'm not saying, listen, you go out here and badmouth your church or anything like that. But what I am saying is be real honest enough about it to understand, hey, when it's good, it's good. When it's not, it's not. Let me ask you, if your lost son or your lost family member, somebody you love, somebody you care very deeply, if you had one Sunday, that one that you've been begging to come to church all these years but still ain't come, if you had one Sunday with them in the house of God, are you satisfied that it's this Sunday? that it's like it is right now? I mean, you satisfied with that singing? You satisfied with the preaching? Are you satisfied with the Sunday school hour? Are you satisfied with the fellowship? Are you satisfied with the prayer that goes on in here? Are you satisfied with the temperature, spiritually speaking, inside this place today? These men knew what it was like to have the power of God on their lives. They had experienced it they knew what it was like. They had cast out demonic spirits before. Luke chapter number 10, read about when the 70s returned. Or when the 70s returned, the Bible says they returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. They understood it. They knew what it was like. Does it not bother you? You don't have what you once had. I'm heartbroken that even here amongst us, even in the Bible Belt of this great country, I'm talking about y'all, y'all understand we're living in the, in the sweet part of America today. The Bible Belt of America. And used to, I'm talking about, you're talking about with the power of God. Amen, that used to be around here. And when I look at what we used to have, and, and, and many of it, I've, it's only testimonies in my life. But I've been around long enough. I've experienced his power. I've experienced his presence. But it bothers me that nobody else seems to be that bothered by not having what we used to have once upon a time. These men were bothered. Are you bothered this morning? Does it bother you? Is there a concern in your life? Number two. The diagnosis, verse number 20, notice this. They asked the question, why could not we cast him out? Verse number 20, Jesus said unto them, notice this, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. My wife teaches English, so I asked her right before I come up here, I said, now, let me get this right. You, that's a personal personal pronoun, right? She said, oh, yeah, that's right. And I said, good. I'm on the right track. Notice the personal pronouns in that verse. They ask the question, Jesus gives them the answer. Count them in verse number 20. He says, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. There's four times he mentions you or ye or your. In other words, here's what I want you to see. What was the problem? The problem wasn't with God. The problem was with them. They were the issue. They were the problem. They were 
the why in the question that they asked the Lord. Could I say the problem this morning is not with the gospel. Amen. The problem this morning is not with the songs we're singing. The problem this morning is not with the book we are preaching from. Amen. The problem is not with our sermons and our outlines and our singing and our this and our that. That's, that's not the problem. The problem is with you and I. And this hasn't changed. But we have. Now I know that's something we don't like to hear, but it's the truth and we need to hear it. Very often we like to put the blame off on somebody else or something else. Well, I tell you the reason we're not doing like we should be doing down there, down there at Freedom Baptist Churches, well, the reality is this is just a different day we're living in. Anybody ever heard that? Probably, I probably told it to you before. <laughs> Well, the reason we're not, we're not doing what we should be doing or, or we could be doing, uh, the reason is, is, you know, because of the area we live in. Man, it's a hard area to reach people down here. These people won't listen to you. I've made that one too. <laughs> I got a whole list of them. I mean, I got all kinds of excuses and all kinds of blame that, uh, you know, why things aren't the way it is, but uh, here's the problem. I get in this book, and I get to talking to God, and God reveals to me, hey, boy, it ain't got nothing to do with the day and hour you're living in, and it ain't got nothing to do with the area that you're living in, but if you want to know the truth about the matter of the why of your question, of the why of the reason that you came explain experience of uh, uh, the power like you once did or like you long to of uh, the problem it's not with your preaching uh, it's not with the singing uh, it's not with the message uh, it's not with the area it's not even with the people but the problem is with you and then I say oh me sorry Lord the revelation of the problem. So I see the concern, I see the diagnosis, and then lastly, I give you this and I'm done, I see the antidote, verse 21. They couldn't figure out what was going on, why they missed it, what the problem was. Verse 21, Jesus says, How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. By prayer and fasting. Basically, here's what the Lord says. You want to see this happen in your life? You want to experience something of this level? It's going to come by prayer and fasting. Let me ask you a question this morning. Two things. Number one, how's your prayer life? Then number two, when's the last time you fasted? Amen. Fasting is biblical, by the way. And, and never will you study about fasting in, your, in the Bible and you'll not find somebody who is desiring something better, something greater, for God to do something in their life, to move in their life. That's why somebody fasts. Let's just be honest. We don't want to give up a meal for anything, right? I just don't believe I'll eat today. Why? Uh, just because. Ain't nobody going to do that. Uh-uh. No. You're going to give up a meal, you're going to fast from something, whether it be food, you know, it's not just food, but that seems to be the common thing we like to, we like to fast from, or whatever it is. The fact of the matter is the reason that an individual will do that is because they're desiring something more. How much time do you spend in prayer? Many, the only time they pray is before they eat or when they come to church. You'll never get the power of God on your life until you first learn to pray. Prayer is the most important thing a Christian can do. It is the number one duty of a Christian's life. Prayer is the only unending obligation that our Lord has given to men. He never said men ought always to work. And I believe men ought to work. Amen. You don't work, you don't eat. That'd fix a lot.